dire non è Arcevici, che, che è nota a fondi del gelato, è eh, un Cristini, eh, un programma che lavora in due volte, che è un po' di costere, attività di maggiore del gelato, che è un po' di Giacomo, che è stato un po' di gelato, che è un po' Andrea Lavuglio, uh, direttore della scuola di architettura, in un ruolo di college wars, una scuola che ho iniziato a scappare di vita, in un ruolo di scuola di design, 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 di Research Fellow in Goldsmith University, and then for us, I catch him and it has a new program with MA in Architecture Association, School of Architecture. But such a young person should be a lot more interesting, which applies to God's level and his own person. Adrian, please. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you very much. Um, tonight I'm going to speak about three projects. The first project is by the um, architect Oscar Niemeyer and it's in Tripoli in Lebanon and it's a bit of a forgotten masterpiece. And I feel like um, I, I decided I would show this today after um, just the last few days being here and realizing how many forgotten masterpieces there are in this region of the world. Um, and also maybe because it resonates with certain issues around post conflict situations, the role of modernism. Um, and and what, what, what going back to modernism might mean today. Um, and then at the conclusion, I'm going to quickly show two of my own projects, um, which are in a sense partially inspired by Oscar Niemeyer's work. Let's start. Um, so Oscar Niemeyer and Tripoli. So this project is um, commissioned in um, 1956. Um, and it's in the northern Lebanese city of Tripoli, which is the second biggest city in Lebanon after Beirut. Um, historically, the site was, was a series of orange, orange groves that were planted. Um, and the project arrives um, at a moment of uh, a kind of first independence moment in Lebanese history. Um, independence takes place in 1948, it's formerly a French protectorate. And like many other countries in the process of, let's say, decolonization, there's a decision to employ modern architecture to um, symbolize um, the entry of the nation um, in, into the world as, as, a kind of, um, as a kind of equal. The work for me came out of um, my PhD research. I wrote a PhD on the idea of scale in architecture. And, and this will, I won't go into this in too much detail, it's probably too technical and can maybe even would require a much longer lecture. But for me, scale always describes a problem. Yeah. Um, so, you know, architects use scale in different kinds of ways. So sometimes you'll say, um, you know, large scale, small scale, in which case scale is a synonym for size. Um, we might talk about you know, ratio or proportion or even hierarchy. But there's another way that architects use scale, which I think is incredibly important. It's when, when they say neighborhood scale or when they say domestic scale. And when they use those terms, they're referring to uh, a set of problems. So the domestic scale might refer to things like um, gender roles or child rearing. You know? um, and then the problem produces certain forms of representation to, to best capture that problem. So in this case, we can, at least in the analysis that I put together of the project, I identify four scales. So the first problem is um, how to give form to a uh, new nation state. And you can see the epistemic frame that um, Niemeyer brings is the precedent of Brazil. It's a territorial problem, so how do you intensify productivity? As you know, in the early moments of nation building projects, there's a really heavy investment in infrastructural projects um, for all kinds of reasons. And so here you can see that the answer or the epistemic frame that's brought to this problem of productivity is um, how you use uh, infrastructure as a mechanism to intensify economic growth. The third one, which is the one I'll talk about today, which is an urban problem, which is how to shape a new political subject. Um, and here, there is a deployment of the exposition type as a kind of pedagogical machine. And I'll go into that a little bit more at the conclusion. 
And finally, an architectural problem. So how to symbolize a secular social body? Um, and in this case, we see a typological displacement of a dome from its um, sacred context to a secular one. So here's an image of um, the site. Um, it was never completed due to the interruption of um, the Lebanese civil war. And so this raises all kinds of questions for me. I first went and saw the site in uh, the mid-90s, and it was still being used as a, um, a, a barracks for the Syrian army. So it was quite difficult to access. Um, we got chased out at gunpoint um, by two unarmed people um, driving a white BMW. Um, and, but we, we kind of persisted in trying to, um, trying to sneak into the site. Eventually we, we got in and, and started to um, beguile me. And this, this project has been a kind of obsession of mine for now many, many years. And why is it an obsession? It's an obsession because I think my generation um, can never access the kind of optimism encapsulated in projects like this except through their subsequent failure. Yeah? So, so it's always mediated by what happens to that project. Yeah? And, and for me that, that optimism is so precious um, and we see very few signs of it everywhere. So in a way this is why I keep returning back to this project. Um, <clears throat> you can see Nehemiah's original sketch um, for, um, for the project. Originally he wanted to locate the site um, right alongside the coast. Um, and, and it, was, it was changed at the last minute, and I was incredibly unhappy. Um, you'll also notice this uh, set of um, parallel lines radiating around the edge of the coast, and this was supposed to be um, a, a set of uh, residential building types. So the other, the other thing to, to, to um, bear in mind is that you know, at this moment in the Lebanese government, there is a really concerted attempt to build um, a, a state, a kind of social welfare state. Uh, and it's a very brief moment, and, and in fact, within a few years, um, a very, very aggressive return to a kind of laissez-faire um, market economy um, interrupts that, that kind of uh, the, the social welfare project. Um, and then, of course, we know in 1975, there's a civil war. And so, so what's important about that? Well, at that moment, there is an attempt by the Lebanese government to stabilize a set of um, quite conflicting interests. Yeah? And, and, and what I'm curious about is like, how architecture gets mobilized in this, um, in, in this very, very complicated um, balance of forces. Um, so on one hand, you have a kind of a persistence of feudalism as a kind of uh, political structure. Um, you have uh, a huge amount of urbanization of rural poor taking place. Um, and unlike many other um, parts of the world, this, the city in, in a Lebanese context doesn't dissolve um, territorial bonds. You know, so the, the kind of classical idea of a city as a space where um, we kind of dissolve and we see anonymity and we understand our, um, our, our allegiance to the nation state through various kinds of institutions. In Lebanon, I guess the opposite happened. I mean, I'm sure Hashim knows whether this is the case or not, but I feel like Lebanon. In fact, what happened is that those rural bonds simply re-territorialized in the city in certain kinds of ways. Um, the other thing to say is that you know the, the your one's natural affinity, which was let's say, um, which was either organized around feudalism on one hand or around a sect, a religious sect on another, um, that for the social welfare state to work, those bonds have to be broken down, yeah? and new kinds of bonds have to emerge to replace them. And this project is a kind of intervention. In that, um, in, that, in that attempt. So you can see the project here, this is an aerial photo. It measures around 600,000 meters squared, it's about 1.2 kilometers um, in its longest um, radius, and it's about 3.2 kilometers in circumference, so it's huge. And Nehemiah always intended that the project would be a kind of laboratory, yeah? that it would, it would start to structure the growth of a metropolis that would somehow start to develop around it. Um, now, of course, the tragedy of the project is that the metropolis never arrives. Yeah? Um, and, of course, Tripoli to this day is, is, um, is incredibly economically stagnant and has all kinds of um, um, you know, quite persistent um, social problems. Nevertheless, um, at, at this moment, there is an idea that, you know, that this would not only form a kind of um, park, um, within this um, urban context, 
but that would start to um, inform the development of the city around it. So, you know, on, on the inside of the project, which I'll show you in a minute, there's a series of prototypical um, architectural forms, an exhibition hall, a national pavilion, an outdoor concert stage, even a helipad. Um, and so it's a kind of petri dish of architectural experimentation. Um, but the housing aspect of it is, is in a way one of the least acknowledged parts of it, and yet somehow one of the most important. You can see here's a drawing. Um, now, of course, as I said, the project is um, not completed. Um, it was interrupted by the Civil War. Um, and um, what was complete is, is basically the bare bones of the project. So it's kind of um, all the concrete shell work is, is, is finished, but none of the interiors were completed. And at the moment, it's a kind of abandoned relic. And, and strangely, very few people know about it, but it's, it's without question one of Neumann's masterpieces. You can see here the entrance hall, I'm uh, sorry, the, the um, entrance plaza, um, these flags to the side. And as you enter into the project, you come up a, a large ramp, um, and it's a really vast uh, entrance plaza. As you come up at the top of the ramp, you start to see a series of almost platonic, um, parabolic, um, and, 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 and other forms. In a very, very interesting orchestration for the site. If, if you go back to the plan, um, there's really two main points of circulation. So the entrance images, which I'm showing, are just up through here, there's that entrance plaza that I showed you with the flags on this side. There's an entrance hall, which is at the top of the ramp. And then you see on this side um, these, these various um, kind of choreography of separate elements linked by a heart. And then on this side, you have a very this long sweeping hall, which nearby uses it also projects, and that's the exposition hall. And interestingly, at the end of the access, which is just here, um, there is housing. <coughs> okay, so let's go through some of these photos. Uh, this is the underside of the um, entrance to the um, outdoor concert stage. So again, and this is something I'll come back to right at the conclusion, there's a continual movement up and down through the side. Yeah, and it's actually fundamental to the project. Yeah? You're always ramping up and dropping back down. Yeah? So, so within the site, there's a series of very, very precisely orchestrated perspectives on, um, on, on the site itself from an elevated uh, vantage point. You can see here the um, outdoor concert stage. The quality of the, um, just the formwork and the concrete work is, is just exceptional. The, the shell of, the, um, of this stage here is about 50 millimeters thick at the, um, at the end. So it's really an absolutely stunning structure. Here yeah, you can see the well, this is the part of the exposition hall that's currently being used. This is the part of it that's still abandoned. You can see here some of the plans. Um, this is Nehemiah's plan for the social housing unit, which is based on the Le Corbusier and Esprit Nouveau module um, and the administrative block plan as well. What's the time? Okay. Um, so this is the conclusion of the, um, of the main access, which I, I love this, yeah. So in fact, where you would expect to find a kind of cultural building, um, it hits a, a, a housing block um, currently being used as, as a hotel. So it's called, this is called the Poly Inn, it's a really dodgy, you know, quite poor hotel in Tripoli. Um, but I love, I love that, kind of, that termination, and for me that speaks of, um, of the importance of, of, of housing within this project, something that's you know, ultimately um, not really capitalised on. Again, that's the exposition of all these very big, beautiful slits to allow light. And you can see the administrative hall in the distance. This is the, um, a kind of prototype for a villa, um, which is included on the site, which is a really quite a, a, a serious state of disrepair. And this is the um, Lebanese National Pavilion, and you'll, you'll see this, I don't know why they're doing it automatically, um, you'll see this recur later on as a kind of influence for, for a project that I worked on. I worked on. This is the bottom of the, the Lebanese Pavilion. This is the administrative hall. This is an um, image of the, the stair detail for the helipad. Okay, and this is the, um, the aerial view. So you can see the kind of um, incredible 
set of, um, of, of, of relationships between the perimeter of the park, um, this uh, housing which is predominantly in the post 1950s, um, and then the Lebanese mountain range, which forms a, 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 a kind of courtyard in a courtyard at a, kind of, um, at a, at a territorial scale. I'm going to talk to you briefly about this, um, this dome, which is really one of the most exceptional um, spaces I've ever experienced in my life. Um, and, and if you want to understand something about you know, what, what, this, what this optimism, or this kind of this failed optimism, or how this is a kind of monument to failed optimism, optimism means, you know, imagine that in 1956, um, the Lebanese government commissioned a, a project, and included in that project was a dome which was supposed to be a venue for experimental music and theatre. Yeah. And just in that single fact alone, you can measure the precise distance between where the Lebanese state is today and, 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 and this moment of like really incredible optimism in the late 1950s. So you can see here um, that the, the dome in, in section has a kind of sunken orchestra pit. Um, you walk in on the perimeter and there's a series of uh, there's like some concentric seating um, which is organised around the edge. And it has one of the most incredible acoustic signatures of any space I've ever been in. Um, the smallest sound um, ricochets along the edges of the space. And it's unclear actually whether this was ever supposed to receive acoustic treatment or whether this was supposed to be a kind of complementary um, kind of acoustic effect and whether, you know, for example, people would have to compose um, performances in the space because the acoustic you know, signature of the space was actually so strong almost to treat the project as a kind of um, uh, musical instrument. You can see some more images of it here. You know, the other really beautiful thing about this dome is that you can um, hear the call to prayer <laughs> at certain times of the day coming through two separate doorways, yeah, through two different, um, two different voices and two different mosques, and they come in at the same time and they reverberate inside of the space, which is kind of incredible. I mean, the other really interesting thing for me is, um, is that Nehemiah takes um, a sacred form, dome, of which there are many in Tripoli. Um, and displaces it and, and, and produces a kind of secular cultural function within, within this kind of um, religious context. You find these all kinds of, you know, I mean, today it's kind of abandoned, you know, people walk their dogs there and that kind of thing, but, um, you know, it's, it's just minimally maintained. So I want to talk a little bit about, like, how we understand a project like this, just in a kind of summary of what we've gone through, through the project. Um, and the work that I've been doing for the last few years is really how you understand this as a kind of pedagogical project within nation building processes. Yeah? So what do I mean by that? Well, if you, if you imagine that at the time, if you recall what I said before, that you know, the Lebanese state, um, the process of modernization of nation building requires taking one set of social bonds or social ties, which are um, familial or feudal, um, dissolving them and re-establishing them at the scale of the nation state. So how does that work? Well, the kinds of crowds that you would see gathered in a space like this, um, the kind of the imagined crowds, um, would have been um, incredibly uncommon, besides protests, um, which I say, there would be no public gatherings of that scale which would be coordinated and orchestrated in the same way. So I think that's the first really important thing. Um, this, and you can see this from the scale of the entry plaza, you can see this from the scale of the spaces between all of the various architectural elements. It's meant for a very, very large crowd for this imagined metropolis which is to come. The other crucial aspect in the design of the project is the shift in elevation. You know? And I think we have to read these, these things as moments in which we're invited to be part of the crowd and then to separate ourselves from the crowd and to look back on it. Yeah? So you see yourself as part of this larger body as an individual and then you plunge back into it. Yeah? So the, the movement through the site is continuing this kind of oscillation 
between being engaged with all of these people and then having a moment of reflection back on your location within that crowd and then being plunged back in. And of course the other really important aspect of it is um, the exhibition. Yeah? So if we imagine that this, this, this kind of movement yeah, um, of going in and out of the crowd, of changing elevation, um, produces a kind of charge, a you know, kind of effect. Um, that effect is then recoded through the pedagogical strategy of the exposition. And we know the exposition historically is, is, is a really fundamental um, um, mechanism within processes of nation building. This is an, an image, of course, of the Great Exhibition in 1851 in London. And we know that you know, these spaces are organized around certain nationalistic narratives. Yeah, you go in there, you see the kind of, um, best and most advanced products of your nation curated alongside the best and most advanced products of other nations and you learn to recognize your own national character within that um, curatorial strategy. So I think, you know, this is not too kind of, um, it's an attempt in a way to sort of move away from a stylistic interpretation of modernism, you know, to, sort of, you know, to talk about it in you know, aesthetic terms and an attempt to, let's say, to reorganize it um, or, or to make a claim for it within a kind of political process of nation building. Let's move on to, to design projects. So this project is um, a design, it's a really strange competition that arrived about six years ago for um, a building in Istanbul um, um, on the um, eastern side uh, near the airport, um, requiring a kind of pedagogical program around disaster and emergency. Um, we didn't really take the competition that seriously, but we thought um, it was an interesting pretext to explore some um, formal ideas that we've been um, playing around with in the studio. I haven't been in practice for about five years. I've been a full-time academic, so I get very nostalgic when I start looking back at my design work and representing it here, um, because I feel like, um, yeah, just personally, I, I feel so disconnected from doing my own design work for so long ago. Hopefully that will change soon. So the project um, is really um, an exploration of quite, quite a simple spatial idea, which is the role of um, proportion and alignment, yeah? um, and the kinds of spatial effects we could produce through, um, through uh, misalignment of, of, of different kinds of uh, spatial orders. So you can see here, um, there's a kind of basic diagram of uh, an enclosing form with two forms sitting within it. Um, that diagram is then um, distorted, yeah? Um, and, and as you see, when it distorts, um, what happens is the alignments start to change proportions. So the dimensionality, and intercolonation, as we would say, um, shifts. Um, and and the, the deformation is in response to certain kind of like um, climatic, um, climatic effects that we're trying to produce. And very simply, um, the idea is that, that Portioning system would then use, would be used to derive um, uh, a kind of a variable arch. So you can see that the project is you know, a kind of mediation on um, on the role of, of, of proportion and dimensionality within um, a digital production process, in which we no longer define um, fixed dimensions, but we define relationships between objects. This diagram. Um, I can quickly take you through the way that the, um, the interior is organized. So you see on the, um, uh, the right-hand side here, um, there's an auditorium. Circulation is um, through the center of the space and then works along the entire perimeter. Uh, there's a kind of elevated perimeter which wraps around um, with, I guess, a garden and then a series of um, kind of uh, interactive installations that we're supposed to speak about, um, uh, kind of resilience, disaster recovery, um, and the built environment. Okay, so you can kind of see how these things work together. But really it's about these two drawings here, ultimately. It's about the elevation. Um, and all I was interested in is this shift in the elevation in the plan where the internal um, row of um, columns um, and the external row 
and misalign and to, to work out like, what that might be able to produce in spatial terms as a kind of um, as a way of accentuating um, and displacing the rhythm of movement through that periphery because you're um, continually getting a kind of compression and expansion on your left and right hand side as you move around the side of the building. It's your plan, you know? And it's, yeah, it's just kind of about the relationship of these things. It's quite simple. So, as I said before, so there's an elevated circulation around that edge. And these just can be small um, elements which somehow float inside of that garden. It's a kind of diagram explaining that. Um, Musicality of that, um, of that rhythm as you wrap around the facade and some uh, remnants. There's a kind of spatial complexity within just on the inside of those arches, which I still find um, somehow quite promising. And actually, the model probably speaks to that. Probably a lot better in terms of the way kind of effects of light that get produced as they seem to move past each other. And the reference to the Niemeyer Living International Pavilion, it's kind of the inspiration for the project in some way. Okay, last project. Um, this is really recent. It's not quite design work, I would say, or it's kind of design work, but it's really research work. So as part of my um, PhD work on scale, I spent a lot of time looking at climate science and climate modelling. The reason was, you know, coming towards, you know, uh, questions of complexity and scale as an architect and, and someone who's teaching in urban design programs for a long time, I found out that the other people that are dealing with really big, complicated things and systems that are interacting is not people, not only people looking at cities, but people looking at the climate. There's a kind of really interesting parallel discourse that was taking place between climate science and urbanism around the issue of complexity. So I got more and more interested in, um, in climate science. And this project is a kind of materialization of one of the chapters from that PhD, which is really looking at, um, really looking at the effects of climate change. So I'll show you, um, this, it's been installed twice already. Um, the first time at the Sosa Museum in Beirut last August, for an exhibition called Let's Talk About the Weather, Art and Ecology in a Time of Crisis that was curated by um, Natasha Bachelet and Nora Razian, um, which is a really beautiful title, Let's Talk About the Weather, because you know, in a Lebanese context, when it's difficult to talk about politics, we know that when we're talking about the weather, we're always really talking about something else. So they're using kind of questions around environment and ecology to open up a kind of political conversation in a context where it's maybe sensitive to have certain kinds of political um, I'll tell you a little bit about the, um, the installation. It's effectively a kind of Buckminster Fuller dome which sits in a forecourt. Um, and it plays um, a series of scientific visualizations of the weather of the Northern Hemisphere um, on the underside. And this comes out of some research that I was, I was doing, um, which I won't go into in too much detail, but it's worth spending a few minutes explaining, um, explaining the research. So in, in the early 2000s, scientists discovered that the Atlantic um, Ocean temperature was changing. You know? And the reason it was changing was not just CO2 emission, it was aerosol emission. You know? So you know, we're used to thinking about climate change in terms of CO2, we're always like, you know, and CO2, is, we can speak about it in terms of the global average that recently passed 400 parts per million, etc. in the atmosphere as a kind of concentration. It's long lived, every single CO2 molecule is identical. Yeah? Every single aerosol particle is unique. Yeah? So what is an aerosol? An aerosol is like when you start a car and parts of the fuel um, don't get combusted properly and they come out as a particle. Yeah? So an aerosol could also be salt that's lifted off the surface of the ocean. It could be sand that's lifted off into the atmosphere um, off the surface of a desert. It's really just a particle floating in the atmosphere. Yeah? Um, so they're all different. And they only last uh, in the air for um, a few weeks and then they settle somewhere. So in fact aerosols become really important because forensically you can track the way air currents move particles from one bit of the world to 
Yeah. So aerosols actually tell us a lot about the architecture of the atmosphere. Anyway, what scientists discovered was that aerosols floating above the Atlantic Ocean were changing the temperature of the Atlantic Ocean because they were changing the amount of the infrared that was hitting the surface of the ocean. Now, the Atlantic Ocean temperature was then changing the intensity of the monsoon in the Sahel, so in sub Saharan Africa. Yeah? So there's this link between aerosol emissions, so industrial production in the northern hemisphere, and the amount of rain that lands in Burkina Faso. Yeah? That's kind of extraordinary. That's the first time that kind of long distance cause and effect relationship is established within climate science. Yeah? So, what are the implications of that? Well, of course, we have things like desertification, we have huge amounts of social stress, and one of the biggest effects is migration due to climate change. Yeah? So, you have huge migratory movements from the sub Saharan area into coastal cities like Lagos, but also, as we know very well, up into the Mediterranean. Yeah? So, there's something interesting here you know, because a lot of the discourse around refugee movement yeah, is to do with the kind of let's say, indigenous problems within, within Africa. But in fact, many of them have you know, kind of been uh, caused by um, pollution from the north. So, the, so this project tells that story. It tells a story of aerosols being emitted from the northern hemisphere, floating down to the equator, and then refugees moving from the equator back up to the Mediterranean. Yeah. This is, kind of, for me, a very, very contemporary story. The other thing that I'm doing, in a way, again, in a kind of homage uh, to Niemeyer, is that it's a kind of secular fresco. So we know historically that the dome um, is, is always a kind of place that represents the relationship between the microcosm and the macrocosm, whether that's articulated through geometric mosaic tiles or, um, or Renaissance frescoes. There's an attempt to, um, in a way, to see through the dome. And there's all kinds of really rich writing, from, especially from people like Robin Evans, around, um, around the, let's say like the, the, the conventions of representation. Um, and then there's a really, there's an interesting theological argument, if, if you're really interested, um, which is the difference between envelopment and emanation. And, and this really um, drove a lot of the, um, of the Renaissance frescoes. They're, they're trying to reconcile two different problems. One is the idea that the heavens are kind of around us, and the other idea is that power always radiates out from a single point. So that was seen as a kind of contradiction. So how's God all around us, and, and, and how does power always radiate out from a single point? And that drove all kinds of representational um, conventions. In this case, I was really interested in saying, okay, instead so of that microcosm, macrocosm relationship read through um, theology, um, what about what if we read it through climate science? So you can see here. And it was installed again um, for uh, Triennale in um, Oslo recently. And we've just discovered um, that we've been invited to install this in the new Amanda Levet space at the Victoria and Albert Museum as part of their Future of Design exhibition. And it'll be the centre of the exhibition for April next year. So we're really excited. We're going to build a much bigger version. So why is this important for me? Well, part of, part of you know, um, materialising this project, because I've written a lot about it and it's been published in all kinds of different um, journals and books, is a really like fundamental challenge around climate change and trying to think through a, a, a really key problem in all of the discourse around climate change, which is that we never experience the climate. Yeah. We always, what we experience is weather. Yeah. And the weather goes up by 10 degrees, it goes down by you know, 5 degrees in the course of a day, and we find that absolutely normal. Climate is statistical. Yeah? So there's a kind of, there's this huge gap between, on one hand, our experience which, of weather, which fluctuates a lot, and then an argument about global climate change which says, well, if we go up by 2 degrees, this is going to be an absolute catastrophe. Yeah? So that, that split between like experience, the, kind of what you experience day to day and the kind of judgments we're being called on to make is in a way part of the, um, 
part of the motivation of the project. And, and the idea is that, well, how do we start to make certain kinds of climatic phenomena visceral? Yeah? How do you bring into experience something that's statistical, something that's like by nature, um, um, outside of experience, beyond the horizon of our own experience, beyond the horizon, therefore, potentially of our decision making? Um, and so part of that is then to say, to start to, to develop a set of experiments um, around the dome. And, and the dome is very important um, because your relationship to the dome is very similar to your relationship to climate, yeah, in the sense that um, it envelops you. It's not a screen, so you don't have a, like a point-by-point -point relationship to something. Yeah? You're not oriented in a single direction. It engages your peripheral vision. So it's, kind of, it's, it's somehow ambient, you know, you're immersed in it, you're not observing something. That's really fundamental. Um, and the other thing that's really incredibly important about it is that it's, um, it's a collective experience. Yeah? So you experience this um, with other people. Yeah? And, and to me that was somehow something that was quite fundamental about, about the research. You can see here some of the, 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 the simulations. What we're looking at at the moment is um, satellite imagery that explains CO2 absorption by plants. And that's really important because what it tells us is that all of the maps that we grow up looking at as children were wrong because the planet, the colours of the planet are changing continually and they follow things like rainfall and sunshine and daylight. So, so actually the earth in itself is kind of, I wouldn't say alive, but it's incredibly animated. Yeah? And, and even just this understanding this animation, for me, produces an entirely different kind of imaginary about the way that we see the planet. And you, know, you take, you know, for example, this red band through here. Um, you know, the ocean, you look at the ocean, you know, we look at an atmosphere, and it's, you know, sky's blue, water's blue. And what we can never see is that these, you know, concealed within that, you know, consistent colour is a kind of architecture. Yeah? It's a kind of dynamic architecture. It's like hot and cold areas, it's areas that are moving quickly, areas that are moving really slow. And climate science and climate visualisation bring that kind of imaginary um, um, into, um, um, into popular consciousness for the very first time. Some other images. So, while this is playing, maybe we can start with taking a few questions. We'll finish it up here. So the, the yellow dots are sand, so things that are lifted off the surface of the desert. Um, the blue ones are sea salt, lifted off, the, um, off the, um, the oceans. And the green ones are forest fires. So, so in fact there's a continual mixture of, um, of anthropogenic and non-anthropogenic aerosols in the atmosphere. So this is kind of explaining. Um, yeah, so you can see that here. The other really fascinating thing, this is a total side note, but we have some time, um, is that about four years ago, they realized that the sand from the Sahara is being carried across the Atlantic Ocean and being deposited in the Amazon. And then, in fact, the entire Amazonian ecosystem is dependent on an 8,000 kilometer long piece of aerial infrastructure that takes um, basically a dead organic matter from a desert in Chad and dumps it in the Amazon. 
because the Amazon, because it's always a nutrient deficit, because it's raining so much, um, its ecology depends on the Sahara, which is mind blowing, you know. And climate science just you know, is starting to make those things more and more visible for all of us.
practices in my own work. So, for example, the project in Istanbul, I think it was quite, it was a kind of formal, you know, in an you know, office sometimes, um, you want to just test something out personally because you're kind of obsessed by it for whatever reason. So it becomes more of a, a kind of a spatial test for us. Um, but I don't think, I wouldn't want to overburden it by saying it does really much more than that. I think it's successful in those terms, but um, whether it's connected up to the other projects, I think is probably besides a kind of, you know, just a, a really innocent formal inspiration by this Nehemiah project.